So the actors are in a very pure process. They've, some of them have likened it to you know, black box theater, no set, no lighting, no nothing, just the other people. And so their emotional axis in the scene is not distracted by anything. It's just that other actor, you know? They have, they have that with each other. That's all they need. That's all actors need is an emotional reality to play within, you know? And they, they love that too because we're not stopping to lay the dolly track or to get the sun to the right position or get all the extras into place or, you know, get all the hardware back to one and get ready to go again. We just, we just roll. We just, okay, all right, let's do it again. Let's go back to one. Let's do it again. And we just get into a session. Sometimes we'll record for 10, 12 minutes straight, maybe, maybe five, 10 takes, different ideas. Hey, why don't you do this? You know, I'll throw them a line on the fly. It's a very creative sandbox, and the actors really love it. Um, either that or they're very good actors and lying about it for years on end. It's all little details that add up to a fantasy character. We just want you to believe they really exist. I and mean, of course we don't. You go into a movie theater, you know you're being transported to a, a fictional fantasy world. But the more you can suspend your disbelief, the more fun it is. You know, I think, I think people want to suspend their disbelief. They don't want to sit there and pick away at it. You know, they just spent whatever it is, 16, 17, 18 bucks to, to go have an experience. They're leaning in. You know, so there's a there's a kind of almost a, a contract between the between the movie and the audience. We're all just gonna join hands and skip off to Pandora together, and it's gonna be fun. And it's not like we're starting from scratch. I mean, we did we were doing water simulations back on Titanic, but it's taking it not just to the next level, but up five levels. You know, we had to we if we started. Five or six years ago, with our with our study of water and our quantification of it, and how we how we create these simulations, we had to future proof ourselves for five, six, seven years down the line, you know, to be ahead of the curve now, right now, today, as we're as we're finishing the film. Um, so I'd say water was the the biggest problem, and that's something we knew going in that was going to be our challenge. But the beauty of of it is, if if you can solve water for this movie, which we've done, which Weta has done, and we worked with them to do it, you never have to look back. You never have to worry about it again. You can do all water anytime until the end of time, right? So these tools become incredibly important to the effects industry at large. It was such a change from, from working on Titanic, you know, where she was... Uh, she was quite experienced at the time that she, but she had never been on a film of that scale. So it was all a bit bigger than her, you know, a bit overwhelming for her. I mean, she did a masterful job, obviously, but um, but on this film, you know, she'd she'd you know been around the block and done enough movies, and you know, she came in and she spent two or three days watching how it was all done, and then basically started producing the the scenes. Uh, but it was fun. I, I welcomed that, and and it was a. We found it both to be not only a great working relationship and the creation of a very strong, memorable character, and, and she enjoyed all that, but um, um, the, almost like the freedom to be in a different body, you know, to just and to have a tail and to have a way of walking and moving. And Kate has quite a, she's got quite a presence in the film. She's not really like anybody else in the movie. Maybe, maybe Nateri is the closest because they're both very, strong kind of alpha characters and of course they clash for that reason and and uh, that was fun watching them watching them meet and clash was is one of my favorite favorite parts of the film the key to it was to shoot really underwater and really at the surface of the water so people were swimming properly and they were they were you know, uh, taking their own weight to get out of the water properly or diving in properly. And it, and it, it just looks like that. It just looks, it looks real because the motion was real. Um, and the emotion was real, <laughs> you know, because these kids are having to learn how to be underwater. They don't know how to be underwater. They, they were raised in the forest. And so, uh, you know, their fear factor probably, probably helped. Although everybody was very, very well trained. And uh, we, we used a very a very safe and systematic way to allow them to, to dive.
They were all scuba trained, but we didn't use scuba. We just did that so that they got used to being underwater for long periods of time. And we went to Hawaii and we got everybody on scuba, but we were also doing free diving training at the same time. I don't think the audience gives you brownie points for making what they think of as photography look like photography. It doesn't work that way. You don't get extra. You only get dinged if you don't do it. But you don't get any bonus. It doesn't make it a better movie in their minds. What makes it a better movie is the, is the people, the characters, the creatures, the things they're seeing, the things they're experiencing. But if they can let go of their disbelief, you know, like, did these guys go to this other planet and shoot it, you know, in, in that handheld documentary style? I feel like I'm really there. You know, it's all working at a subliminal level. It's taking away the disbelief. And if they believe in it and they invest in it, now it's up to the story and the characters to work on the audience's heart and mind.